Our third and final soft chalk lesson in Unit 1, Lecture 2 deals with the bacterial cytoplasmic membrane and cellular transport in bacteria. So again, let's start out with our fundamental statements or bullet points. Uh, the bacterial cytoplasmic membrane is a fluid phospholipid bilayer and it encloses the bacterial cytoplasm. The cytoplasmic membrane is semi-permeable and determines what enters and leaves a bacterial cell. Passive diffusion is the net movement of gases or small uncharged polar molecules like water across a membrane from higher concentration to lower concentration. Passive diffusion is powered by potential energy of a concentration gradient. It doesn't require the expenditure of metabolic energy or the use of transport proteins. Facilitated diffusion is powered by a potential energy of a concentration gradient like passive diffusion. It doesn't require the expenditure of metabolic energy like passive diffusion, but it does require the use of transport proteins, and that makes it facilitated diffusion, the transport proteins. A solution refers to a solute dissolved in a solvent. Osmosis is the movement of water across a membrane from an area of higher water or lower solute concentration to an area of lower water or higher solute concentration by both passive diffusion and by facilitated diffusion. Active transport is a process whereby the cell uses both transport proteins and metabolic energy to transport substances across the membrane and against the concentration gradients. It can go from lesser to greater concentration. Most molecules and ions that a cell needs to concentrate within the cytoplasm in order to support life require active transport for entry into cells. In order to colonize an environment, bacteria must be able to effectively use their transport systems to compete with other bacteria as well as with other cells or organisms like human cells for the limited nutrients available. Bacteria divide by a process called binary fission and the number of bacteria increase by geometric progression because of that binary fission. And lastly, some antimicrobial agents alter the microbial cytoplasmic membrane, thus causing leakage of cellular needs. Now let's look at the detailed learning objectives. Now this is a fairly long soft chalk lesson because it deals with transport of materials into cells, but keep in mind most of this you already had in your prerequisite biology course when you discussed the plasma membrane. Bacterial membranes and eukaryotic membranes aren't that different and they use many of the same systems to transport materials in and out of the cell. So you should be able to state the chemical composition and major function of the cytoplasmic membrane in bacteria. Briefly describe the fluid phospholipid bilayer arrangement of biological membranes. State the net flow of water when a cell is placed in an isotonic, hypertonic, or hypotonic environment and relate this to solute concentration. Define the following means of transport passive diffusion, osmosis, facilitated diffusion, transport through channel proteins, transport through uniporters, active transport, transport through antiporters, transport through symporters, the ABC transport system, and group translocation. And then state how the antibiotic polymyxin and disinfectants like orthophenylphenol chlorhexidine, hexachlorophene, zephyrin, and alcohol affect bacteria. Define binary fission and geometric progression and relate that to bacteria being able to astronomically increase their numbers in a fairly short period of time. And lastly, briefly describe the process of binary fission in bacteria stating the function of PAR proteins, the divisome and FTSZ proteins. So those are our bullet points and our detailed learning objectives for the bacterial cytoplasmic membrane and cellular transport.
So let's start out by looking at the cytoplasmic membrane in terms of its structure. Now, as we mentioned earlier under pro and eukaryotic cells, the cytoplasmic membrane is also called a cell membrane because it surrounds a cell. It's also called a plasma membrane. Uh, it's only about seven nanometers thick and it lies internal to the bacterial cell wall and it encloses the cytoplasm. So as we pointed out before, membranes typically look like railroad tracks uh, inside the cell. Here we see the thick cell wall and then inside of that is the dark light dark appearance, the railroad track appearance of the cytoplasmic membrane that's enclosing the cytoplasm. Now, as we know, uh, like all biological membranes, the bacterial cytoplasmic membrane is composed of phospholipids and protein molecules. And as we said, it appears as two dark bands separated by a light band uh, when seen in an electron micrograph. And that dark light, dark appearance is actually because it is a bilayer, two layers of phospholipids. Uh, with the exception of mycoplasmas, the only bacteria that don't have a cell wall, bacterial membranes lack sterols. But bacteria usually contain sterol-like molecules called hopanoids. And the sterols in the eukaryotic cell and the hopanoids in the prokaryotic cell most likely help stabilize the cytoplasmic membrane and help to regulate membrane fluidity. Now the phospholipid bilayer forms naturally when phospholipids are in a liquid because uh, the phospholipid molecule has a portion that is water soluble or polar and a portion that's water insoluble or nonpolar. And the water soluble part is the phosphate glycerol portion. And if we look at our figure two here, we see that the yellow ball represents the water-soluble glycerol phosphate part of a phospholipid. And that part being water-soluble tries to orient itself towards water, which would be outside of the cell and inside of the cell. But the other part of the phospholipid is nonpolar or water-insoluble. That's the fatty acid part that's insoluble, illustrated by two lines indicating the two chains of fatty acids. And so as we see in the center of the membrane, they orient themselves away from water. So if we were to just put phospholipids in a liquid and stir them up, they would form a, a, lipid phospholi a phospholipid bilayer sphere. And it is a um, liquid phospholipid bilayer because nothing holds these phospholipids together. Uh, in fact, the proteins that are in the membrane can float around and move around in amongst the phospholipids as we see in the diagram here. And there's a little self-check there you can do, as well as another animation from YouTube that explains the cytoplasmic membrane structure. Now let's get into the function as it relates to cellular transport in bacteria. Of course, as you already know, the cytoplasmic membrane is a selective, selectively permeable membrane. It determines what goes in and out of the cell in this case, the organisms, since they're single-celled organisms. So of course, all cells have to take in and then retain all the chemicals they need for metabolism. Uh, some things like water and dissolved glasses and lipid soluble molecules can diffuse right across the phospholipid bilayer between the phospholipids. Some water-soluble uh, ions generally pass through small pores in the membrane that allow them to enter. But pretty much everything else requires carrier molecules or transport proteins to transport them through. So we'll be looking at the various versions of cellular transport in this section here, starting with passive diffusion. Now passive diffusion is the net movement of gases or small uncharged polar molecules across a phospholipid bilayer from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration. So diffusion always involves molecules moving from greater to lesser concentration. And this is how many gases cross the membranes of cells. This is how gases like nitrogen, oxygen, and carbon dioxide can cross membranes. 
This is how water crosses the membrane. Now in passive diffusion, you have to remember that all molecules have motion. So all molecules and atoms possess kinetic energy or the energy of motion. And so if these molecules or atoms are not evenly distributed on both sides of the cell, then you have a concentration gradient that forms. And that gradient represents potential or stored energy. So the net movement of these particles will be down their concentration gradient from an area of higher concentration to lower concentration. So again, in summary, diffusion is powered by the potential energy of a concentration gradient, and it does not require the expenditure of metabolic energy like ATP. And it's based on the energy of motion. So if we think about how that would work in our first animation, and I'd like to stress that it's very important in this soft chalk lesson to be looking at and visualizing the animations. Don't just memorize words, but look and follow the animation so you can visualize it from beginning to end. And then you'll be able to remember it and see its significance. So let's take a case of oxygen entering and leaving a cell. In this first animation here, uh, we see the cytoplasmic membrane surrounding a bacterium and the little light blue molecules are oxygen. Now notice there's more molecules of oxygen outside the cell than inside. And so these molecules, as we'll see in a minute when we start the animation, are always in motion. Well, if there's more moving molecules on this side than this side, on the outside rather than inside in this case, then there's a greater chance of a molecule of oxygen hitting the membrane and going through from the outside to inside than inside to outside. There's simply less molecules inside to move and contact the membrane and go out. They can go in and out, but the net flow will be into the cell because there's more of these moving molecules outside the cell hitting the membrane. And so this will continue until they're evenly distributed. Now, once they're evenly distributed, then there's an equal chance that these oxygen molecules will pass through the membrane in either direction. So the cell cannot concentrate materials this, uh, using this method of passive diffusion, but it can get the same amount inside a cell as outside. So let's look at our animation started up here. Those are the oxygen molecules. That's the cytoplasmic membrane. Now, oxygen can pass between the phospholipids. It doesn't require transport proteins. They're small enough they can pass between the phospholipids of the phospholipid bilayer. So these molecules of oxygen are in motion. They have kinetic energy. And so as you see, there's a greater chance that an oxygen molecule is going to hit the membrane and go in then go out, and that will continue until they're evenly distributed. Uh, but at that point, then there would be an equal chance of them hitting the membrane and uh, then go in or out. So again, this is a movement of very small molecules or ions through a phospholipid bilayer from greater to lesser concentration. <clears throat> but again, you, the cell can't concentrate materials this way. Now, osmosis is the one we need to know in greatest detail because we'll be applying that quite a bit. And you've also had that, of course, in your biology class. But we'll try to spend a little time explaining this here. So remember, osmosis is the diffusion of water across a membrane from higher water concentration or lower solute concentration, since they mean the same thing, to lower water concentration or higher solute concentration. Now remember, it's water that's moving across the membrane during osmosis, not solute. So it's always going following diffusion uh, rules. It's going from higher water to lower water, greater concentration to lesser concentration. It's the water that's passing between the phospholipids, but also through pores in the membrane called aquaporins. So being diffusion and being partially uh, passive diffusion, osmosis is powered by the potential energy of the concentration gradient, like we saw with the oxygen up above. It doesn't require the expenditure of metabolic energy like ATP. So first of all, water crosses the membrane by passive diffusion. The water molecules are small enough 
to pass between the phospholipids and the cytoplasmic membrane. So when that's happening, passing between the phospholipids, that's passive diffusion. But water transport is also enhanced by transport proteins called aquaporins, pores big enough to allow free water to cross the membrane through the pore. And so these are channel proteins that play a role in facilitated diffusion, which we'll take up in the next section after passive diffusion. So water actually enters a and leaves a cell two ways, through passive diffusion, when it passes between the phospholipids of the membrane, and through facilitated uh, diffusion, when it passes through pores called aquaporins during facilitated diffusion. But to understand osmosis, really all we need to do is understand what a solution is. So we have to go back to a little of your general biology stuff. A solution, remember, is a solute dissolved in a solvent. So in terms of osmosis, the solute would be anything dissolved in water, and water would be the solvent. So the solvent, water, is what does the dissolving. What's being dissolved in the solvent or water is the solute. So when sugar dissolves in water, sugar is a solute, water is a solute, solvent. When salt dissolves in water, salt is a solute, water is a solvent. And what happens here is that when we say something dissolves in water, what we really mean is that it forms weak hydrogen bonds with the water. Now the free water molecules, not bound to solute, are small enough to pass through the membrane pores and between the phospholipids. But once water is bound to solute, it's too big to pass through the pores or between the phospholipids. So when we say water is going from a higher water to a lower con water concentration, we're talking about free water, not water bound to solute. So because of that, the higher the solute concentration, the lower the concentration of free water that can pass through the membrane. And that's why they seem opposite up here. If you have a higher water concentration, that's because you have low solute. You don't have much free water bound to solute because you don't have much solute. So the lower the solute concentration, the less water can bind to it, so the more free water you have. Likewise, if you have a high solute concentration and water is forming hydrogen bonds with a solute, then you're gonna have a lower water concentration. The more solute, the more water is bound to the solute, the less free water there is. And we can see that in figures 4a and 4b here. So let's take the take case of sugar dissolving water. Uh, this represents the membrane, so this could either be the phospholipids, now free water, and the water molecules look kind of like Mickey Mouse here because it's an apolar molecule. Those are the two hydrogens which lie off center to the oxygen. Free water is small enough to pass between the phospholipids or if this was an aquaporin, to pass through the aquaporin during facilitated diffusion. But once water binds to solute, notice what happens here is that the hydrogen on the water molecules is forming weak hydrogen bonds with the sugar. So when something dissolves in water, we're saying it's actually forming hydrogen bonds with the water. And the more sugar you have binding water, the more solute binding water, the less free water you have. So it's only the free water that's passing through the membrane. Once water has bound to the solute, it's too big to go through the membrane. So the more solute, in this case sugar you have, the less free water you have. And the less solute you have, the more free water you have. Now in the case of salt, it dissolves in water forming sodium and chloride ions. And so the positive, partial positive of the hydrogen ions is attracted to the negative chloride ions and forms a weak hydrogen bond. And the positive sodium ion forms a uh, bond with the weak oxygen, partial negative of the oxygen. So the hydrogen ion part has a partial positive charge, the oxygen part has a positive negative. Uh, since they're not evenly distributed. So again, the sodium binds to the oxygen, the chloride binds to the hydrogen, but once water is bound to the solute, it's too big to go through the pores. 
So the more solute you have, the less free water you have. So water is always going from greater to lesser water or towards a side with more solute, which is a side that has lesser water. So a cell can find itself in one of three environments. And we often refer to osmosis and bacteria by looking at the environment surrounding the cell. So whenever you see the word environment, that's the area surrounding the cell. And those in three environments could be isotonic, hypertonic, or hypotonic. Now, as far as these uh, three prefixes, iso, remember, means the same. Hyper means more. Hypo means less. But when we're talking about osmosis and tonicity, these prefixes refer to the solute concentration, not the water concentration. So in a hypertonic environment, there would be more solute, hypertonic, more solute, therefore less water. In a hypotonic environment, there would be less solute, therefore more water. Isotonic, there'd be the same amount of solute on either side, therefore the same amount of water on either side. So if we take an isotonic environment, and there aren't too many isotonic environments in nature, but that means that the solute concentration, isotonic, is the same on both sides of the membrane. Therefore, the water concentration is also the same. And water flows in and out of the cell at an equal rate. So there's no pressure from water accumulating inside the cell. There's no dehydration from water going out of the cell. Water flows in and out at a neutral rate and has a neutral effect on the cell. So again, if we look at our animations of osmosis, in this case, the animation of osmosis in an isotonic environment. This is the cytoplasmic membrane and with aquaporins in it. Now remember, free water, the water not bound to solute, the little Mickey Mouse molecules, can either pass between the phospholipids in either direction or through the aquaporins during facilitated diffusion. So when water is going between the phospholipids, that's passive diffusion. When it's going through an aquaporin, that's facilitated diffusion because it's facilitated by a transport protein. So notice this is an isotonic environment, which means the solute concentration is the same inside and out of the cell. So the brown molecules in the center, those are solute, let's say sugar. And there's the same amount of solute outside as inside. Well, of course, water binds to the solute. Any water not bound is free water. But if there's the same amount of solute on either side, there's the same amount of free water on either side. And it's only the free water that can pass between the phospholipids or through the pores. Water bound to solute can't get through because it's too big. <coughs> so let's take a look at what happens here. In an isotonic environment, notice the free water going out in through an aquaporin. Here's a water molecule going out between the phospholipids. There's water going in between the phospholipids, but there's the same amount of water on either side. There's water bound to solute, but it's too big to go through the phospholipids. So since you have the same amount of free water inside and outside, there's an equal chance they're going to hit the membrane and go through, and water flows in and out at the same rate. But again, water bound to solute can't get through the aquaporins or between the phospholipids. Now let's take a look at an environment that's been made hypertonic with solute. So hypertonic means there's more solute outside of the cell than inside, therefore less free water outside of the cell. Now remember in a hypertonic environment, if the environment is hypertonic, then the content inside the bacterium would be hypotonic. If there's more solute outside in the environment, there would have to be less solute inside hypotonic. So in this case, since there's less solute inside the cell, the water concentration is greater inside the cell. And so now the net flow of water is out of the cell. There's more free water molecules moving inside the cell than outside, so there's a greater chance they're going to go through the aquaporins or between the phospholipids and out of the cell. And what this can do is lead to dehydration. 
water flows out of the cell to the point where there may not be enough uh, water to support enzyme reactions. So let's take a look at our second animation of a bacterium in a hypertonic environment. So again, hypertonic means that there is more solute, hypertonic, more solute outside than inside. Therefore, there's less free water outside because it's bound to solute. There's more free water inside because there's not as much solute for the water to bind to. So that's the water bound to solute, and of course, that's the free water. And as we see, since there's less solute inside, there's more free water inside, and more solute, therefore, less free water outside. So the net flow, there's a greater chance of the water molecule hitting the membrane from the inside and going out rather than going in, although they can go in either direction. So in a hypertonic environment, notice there's more free water molecules inside so they can pass between the phospholipids, passive diffusion, or through the aquaporins, facilitated diffusion. And again, there's more moving molecules inside. Water bound to solute can't get through because it's too big. So now the net flow of water is out of the cell. It can still pass in like that molecule did, but there's simply less free molecules of water outside. And again, once water is bound to solute, it can't go through the aquaporins or between the phospholipids. So in this case, the net flow of water would be out of the cell, and that can lead to dehydration. Now finally, if the environment is hypotonic, then hypotonic means less solute in the environment. So the water concentration will be greater outside the cell because there's less solute for the water to bind to. And since the solute concentration is higher inside the cell, there will be less free water inside the cell. So now the net flow of water is into the cell. So if we take a look at our third animation of a cell in a hypotonic environment, So again, we see that this is a hypotonic environment. There's more, there's less solute outside the cell, hypotonic, less solute outside. Therefore, there has to be more solute, hypertonic inside. And if there's more solute, then most of the water is bound to the solute. There's less free water inside. Since there's less solute to bind to, there's more free water outside. So there's a greater chance that these free water molecules are going to pass between the phospholipids or go through the aquaporins from outside to inside. They can go in and out as well. There's just simply less of these free molecules moving to hit the membrane. So the net flow of water will be into the cell in this case, in a hypertonic environment. So again, we see free water passing through the aquaporin there between the phospholipids, through the aquaporin again, between the phospholipids. Water bound to solute can't get through, so remember the solute's not moving here, it's only water that's moving during osmosis. So as we see here, the net flow of water is into the cell, the side with more solute or less free water. It can go either way, but the net flow is into the cell, and that creates pressure inside the cell called osmotic pressure. And that can actually cause cells to burst from the pressure, but bacteria don't burst because they have a peptidoglycan cell wall, which prevents them from bursting. Since bacteria are concentrating nutrients inside the cell, those nutrients are in the form of solute. So inside a bacterium, it's typically hypertonic to its environment. And therefore, the net flow of water is typically into a bacterium. And as that water flows in, the membrane could swell and swell like a balloon being filled with water until it bursts. But there's a cell wall that lies outside of the membrane. So the membrane can only swell until it hits the cell wall. Then it can't expand any further, and that prevents water from accumulating, creates a turgor or back pressure. So the reason bacteria really need their cell wall is to prevent osmotic lysis because they live in hypotonic environments since they're concentrating nutrients. And we'll see more about that when we get to the cell wall in the next unit. And there's a little self-check you can do on osmosis 
So there's more questions on osmosis than the other forms of transport, since that's something we do apply quite a bit. Now our next form of diffusion is called facilitated diffusion rather than passive diffusion. So facilitated diffusion is so named because the diffusion is facilitated or aided by transport proteins, carrier proteins like uniporters or channel proteins. But it's still the fusion. It's still going to be the movement of molecules along the concentration gradient from higher concentration to lower concentration. So it still follows the fusion rules. Molecules or ions or atoms are moving from greater to lesser concentration, but they're not passing between the phospholipids. They require transport proteins to get in. So it's diffusion facilitated by transport proteins. And there are two major groups of transport proteins found in facilitated diffusion called uniporters and channel proteins. Now a uniporter is a carrier, porter means to carry, una means one. These are transport proteins that transport a substance from one side of the membrane to the other from greater to lesser concentration because it is following diffusion rules. And this is how potassium ions enter bacteria. So if we look at our animation of a uniporter during facilitated transfusion, if this was passive diffusion, the molecules would just pass between the phospholipids. But in this case, they're going through a transport protein called the uniporter. So that's the difference again. It's diffusion involving a transport protein, such as this uniporter. And so there's more of these molecules outside than inside. So there's a greater chance they're gonna hit the uniporter and pass through. So no energy is involved in that. It's still involving moving molecules. Potential energy of a concentration gradient go from greater to lesser concentration. Now once the, uh, they got an even amount inside and outside, then they could hit and go out the same speed. So again, it's still a diffusion where cells can't concentrate materials, but it can get the same amount inside as outside but it can't pass through the membrane. It's going through a special transporter protein called the uniporter that's transporting just one substance across that membrane from greater to lesser concentration. Now a channel protein simply forms pores. So that's another form of facilitated diffusion and the aquaporins that we mentioned during osmosis are channel proteins. So as we mentioned under osmosis, uh, Water can, free water can pass through the membrane by passive diffusion when it passes between phospholipids or by facilitated diffusion when it passes through a channel protein called an aquaporin. So it's being facilitated by the transport protein or channel protein here. And we showed you that up under osmosis. And there's also a little YouTube movie there on passive transport if you want to watch that and a little self-check you can do. So that's facilitated diffusion. Diffusion facilitated by a transport protein, but still the fusion, something going from greater to lesser concentration until evenly distributed and not a way to transport or not a way to concentrate materials. So what cells have to rely on to concentrate materials to keep bringing them in even though there's more inside, and that's really essential for most metabolism. Cells have to concentrate nutrients. So for most molecules entering the cell that support life, active transport's needed. Now in active transport, the cell's using both transport proteins and metabolic energy, not potential energy of a concentration gradient, but using cellular metabolic energy to transport stuff in. So it still requires transport proteins. They don't pass between the phospholipids. They require transporter proteins. But the cell has to spend some of the energy it's making to do this. It's using energy to pump molecules in in order to concentrate them. And this allows the cell to transport substances across the membrane against the concentration gradient. Uh, so even though you have more inside than outside, the cell can use energy to keep bringing it in, to keep concentrating it inside. 
And so it's active transport that really allows cells to accumulate the needed substances, even when the concentration is lower outside, to bring in enough molecules to support life. And so active transport enables bacteria to compete with other organisms for the limited nutrients found in most natural habitats. So there are several forms of metabolic energy that can be used to transport materials into the cell. One of the most common in bacteria is called proton motive force. And this is an energy gradient resulting from hydrogen ions, H pluses, positively charged hydrogen ions, or protons, uh, moving across the membrane from greater to lesser hydrogen ion concentration. So just like electrons moving through a wire provides electricity for, say, a light, moving protons are also a form of energy. And they provide energy that can be used to transport materials into or out of the cell. So a lot of times the movement of molecules in and out of the cell is coupled with the movement of protons in or out of the cell. It can also be provided by the energy provided by the hydrolysis of breakdown of ATP, or it can be breakdown of some other high energy compound like the phosphoenyl pyruvate that's one of the high energy compounds produced during glycolysis. So the cell is spending some of its energy to bring molecules into the cell to concentrate them. So this requires, again, specific transport proteins, sometimes called carrier proteins, and they're usually very specific for a particular molecule or group of molecules. And of course, it's going to also involve energy. So there are several types of transport protein systems we'll be looking at here. That can include antiporters, symporters, the proteins found in the ATP binding cassette system of bacteria, and the proteins involved in group translocation in bacteria. So remember, these are all active transport involving transport proteins and metabolic energy, starting with antiporters. Now, anti refers to opposite, porter is something that carries something. So these are transport proteins that transport. Uh, one substance across the membrane in one direction while trans simultaneously transporting a second substance across the membrane in the opposite direction. So anti means opposite. Uh, so one molecule is being transported in while another simultaneously being transported out. And this typically uses the proton motive force. It's the protons moving across the membrane, the H plus or protons, the hydrogen ions, that are providing energy to transport the other molecule across the membrane. And this is how sodium ions, for example, enter cells through antiporters. So we see an example of that down here in this next animation. So notice on this side of the membrane, we have sodium ions and hydrogen ions. And those hydrogen ions were pumped out by the electron transport chain where they accumulate, creating an energy gradient where there's more hydrogen ions on one side than the other. And there's also more sodium ions on one side than the other. And this is the antiporter in between. So notice what happens here with an antiporter is the hydrogen ions are going from outside to inside from greater to lesser concentration, but that provides a way to pump sodium out of the cell. The cell doesn't want to accumulate excessive amounts of sodium, so it needs to pump it out, kind of like the sodium potassium pump that you see in eukaryotic cells, if you remember that from biology. So uh, the energy is provided by the hydrogen ions, which are greater on one side than the other going in, but that provides energy to pick up the molecules that are less in concentration and actively pump them out. So if we look at that one more time, we see as the hydrogen ions are entering the cell, the sodium ions are being pumped out. So they're going in opposite directions, powered by the hydrogen ions, and that would be an antiporter. Two substances being transported across the membrane in opposite directions. Now a symporter, sim refers to together, 
This will simultaneously transport two substances across the membrane in the same direction. And again, it's usually powered by moving protons or hydrogen ions. But now as the hydrogen ions enter, they also bring in the other substance being co-transported across the membrane together. And this is the way phosphate and sulfate and a few other things enter bacteria. So if we look at our animation of a symporter, now uh, the symporters and the antiporters are also ways to bring in carbohydrates, to bring in amino acids, to bring in other things that are needed. Remember, cells need to concentrate the carbohydrates as an energy source and as building blocks. They have to uh, bring in the amino acids to use for protein synthesis, etc. So here we have a symporter. And here are the hydrogen ions, higher on this side than outside, but now the cell wants to bring in these carbohydrates. CHO means carbohydrate. And so as the hydrogen ions flow from, uh, in the cell through the symporter, that provides the energy to bring the carbohydrates in. So even though there's more carbohydrates inside the cell than outside, the moving protons are gonna keep providing energy to bring more carbohydrates in, like we see here. So both the hydrogen ion and the carbohydrates are co-transferred across the membrane, the energy provided by the proton motor force of the hydrogen ions. And in this way, the carbohydrate in this case can be concentrated. So antiporters and symporters are often used to concentrate materials the cell needs like sugars and amino acids and uh, uh, other molecules. Now these last two binding systems are something we see unique to bacteria, not in eukaryotic cells. Uh, so one is called the ATP binding cassette system or ABC system. As name implies, this depends on the breakdown of ATP to provide the energy. And uh, this is something we see frequently in gram-negative bacteria because there are proteins located in the paraplasm between the bacterial cytoplasmic membrane and between the cell wall. They're called paraplasmic binding proteins. So these are found in a gel-like solution that lies between the bacterial cytoplasmic membrane and the cell wall, and they pick up specific substances the cell wants to transport in, and they carry it to the transport proteins in the membrane. Then the hydrolysis of ATP provides energy, and that energy powers the transport of that substrate uh, by means of the transporter proteins across the membrane into the cell. So again, in this way, materials can be concentrated inside the cell. And uh, a good number of different sugars and amino acids are transported into bacteria using the ATP binding cassette system. Now again, this is much easier to follow in an animation than to read or hear. So let's look at our animation on the ABC transport system. So this is the cytoplasmic membrane of the bacteria. This is inside the cell, the cytoplasm. And this is the cell wall outside of the membrane. Now the space between the cytoplasmic membrane here and the cell wall here is called paraplasm. And these are paraplasmic binding proteins. These are proteins that can pick up a specific substrate that like this little red square and carry it to the transporter that's gonna be involved in active transport. So these are carriers along the way. That's where I originally got the name cassette system where you would plug cassettes in to play them in the old days. Uh, so it's like the paraplasmic binding proteins picking up something and pick, putting it in the cassette and plugging it in. So as you see here, the substrate that the bacterium needs, the little red squares there are gonna bind to specific paraplasmic binding proteins that fit that substrate. And then the paraplasmic binding protein plugs it into the transport protein. And this is what's going to transport it across the membrane, but that requires energy. And that energy comes from the hydrolysis of ATP. So ATP is going to bind to an ATP hydrolyzing enzyme. And as the ATP is broken down into ADP phosphate and energy, that energy is going to be used to transport this red substrate across the membrane to the inside to concentrate it. So here we see the ATP binding to the hydrolyzing enzyme, releasing energy. 
and breaking the ATP into ADP and phosphate. And that energy is going to be used to transport that little red substrate across the membrane. So that's the ABC transport system. And uh, well over 200 of these have been discovered in bacteria where different uh, paraplasmic binding proteins and transport systems transport different materials into the cell. And again, we see that in bacteria. Now the final method is called group translocation. This also is only seen in prokaryotic cells or bacteria. Now in group translocation, the substance being transported is chemically altered as it's transported across the membrane so that once it's transported across, it's been altered and it remains inside the cell. And an example of that is actually the first step in glycolysis in bacteria. Um, the bacteria need to bring in glucose in order to start breaking that down via glycolysis to eventually produce ATP. And so the high energy source that's going to drive that is actually one of the compounds made in glycolysis, a high energy phosphate group from phosphoenolpyruvate. Uh, and again, you don't have to remember your steps in glycolysis for this, but you may remember that during glycolysis, the first step is that phosphate attaches to glucose to form glucose 6-phosphate. And that's where the cell has to use one of its ATPs in, the, in mitochondria uh, to begin to alter the glucose. Remember, at the beginning of glycolysis, the cell has to use two of its stored ATPs. Well, bacteria don't have mitochondria, so the first step of glycolysis is actually transporting the glucose across the membrane. As glucose is transported across the membrane, the phosphate's added. So the first step in glycolysis, the formation of glucose 6-phosphate, actually occurs inside the cell. And if we look at our animation of that, again, it's easier to look at the animation to follow it. So again, here we have the cytoplasm inside the bacterium, the membrane, the cell wall. And this is the phosphotransferase system that's involved in that. This is going to transfer a high energy phosphate group to the glucose as it enters, so that once it enters, it becomes glucose with a phosphate attached, glucose 6-phosphate. And that's going to provide the energy for the transport as well. So there's a glucose that the cell needs to transport in. This is the high energy compound, phosphoenolpyruvate or PEP. Now again, you don't have to know the name of that, but this is one of the high energy groups produced during glycolysis. So that is a high energy compound and it can donate a high energy phosphate group through this phosphoenolpyruvate system and attach it to the glucose. So as we see here, the high energy phosphate groups transfer to a series of enzymes that transfer it to the transport protein. It's going to transport glucose into the cell, the brown circle being glucose. So the phosphates shuttle along the enzymes, and as the glucose enters, the phosphate's attached, and now uh, the glucose has been altered as it enters. It's changed from glucose to glucose 6-phosphate. So that happens to be how bacteria get in glucose and occasionally some other sugars into the cell for their use. And in the latter two systems, uh, the ABC cassette system versus the group translocation, just to be able to kind of match up the description with the type of transport. And there's a little YouTube movie on group translocation and a group check you can do on active transport. Now we're talking about prokaryotic cells. There's a number of functions of the cytoplasmic membrane in bacteria other than selective permeability. That is, of course, the major function, determining what goes in and out. But remember, because of their small size and their large surface area to volume ratio, uh, bacteria don't need specialized internal membrane-bound organelles that eukaryotic cells need. So they can carry out their chemical reactions or their transport of materials 
right straight across the membrane because you have a lot of surface area of membrane to bring stuff in and to produce energy and such, but very little volume to feed. So simple diffusion can distribute that throughout the cell because of the small cell size and the large surface area to volume ratio that we previously learned about. So here's some of the functions associated in the cytoplasmic membrane of bacteria. Rather than, my, uh, than ATP production occurring in mitochondria, energy production occurs uh, in the cytoplasmic membrane. So that's where we find the electron transport system for bacteria that have both aerobic and anaerobic respiration. Aerobic is where energy is the final electron acceptor, but some bacteria have anaerobic respiration where some molecule other than oxygen is the final electron acceptor. And this is also where the photosynthetic apparatus is found during photosynthesis, where light energy is converted into chemical energy. So during aerobic respiration, uh, ATP production, chemiosmosis, through the electron transport system actually occurs um, in the cytoplasmic membrane of bacteria. The electron transport chain pumps protons across the membrane where they accumulate and produce a high energy concentration gradient. So as the electron transport system goes along, protons keep being pumped out where they accumulate between the membrane and the wall. And now that you have more protons on this side than this side, they re-enter through ATP synthase and that actually rotates, provides energy to rotate a little nanomotor that connects phosphate to ADP to make it ATP. And eventually the hydrogen ions and an oxygen atom combine to form water as an end product. So chemiosmosis occurs in the cytoplasmic membrane of bacteria rather than in the inner membrane of mitochondria like in eukaryotic cells. But again, because of the large surface area to volume ratio, uh, making ATP here at the surface can easily feed the whole cell because there's very little volume to uh, feed and a great deal of surface area producing ATP. It's also where the motor for bacterial flagella is located. Remember the bacterial flagella don't whip in back and forth with sliding filaments like eukaryotic flagella. There's a little rotary motor in the cytoplasmic membrane. And so again, as the electron transport system, like we saw over here, pumps protons across the membrane, these hydrogen ions, as they're pumped across the membrane, they accumulate between the cell wall and the membrane, creating an energy gradient. And as the protons, the hydrogen ions, move through the motor, they provide energy to rotate the motor, just like they rotate the ATP synthase. And that provides the mechanical energy then to rotate the rod that connects to the hook that connects to the filament, causing the flagellum to rotate like a propeller. So the cytoplasmic membrane is the site of insertion for the uh, attachment site or basal body of the bacterial flagellum, as we'll see later in this unit when we take up flagella. The membrane, of course, is also the site of waste removal. Not only does the membrane determine what goes in, it determines what goes out. So of course, waste products, waste products have to be pumped out across the membrane. And then a few bacteria like the genus Bacillus and the genus Clostridium, as we'll see later in unit one, produce dormant resistant survival forms called endospores, where each vegetative bacterium shown here in red produces a dormant resistant survival form called an endospore. And once that endospore is released, it's dumped out of the cell, the rest of the cell is degraded, and that endospore can resist various harsh environments, including boiling water, lack of nutrients, and other adverse effects until there's a good environment, at which time the endospore can germinate and the bacterium can start growing again. Now again, we're going to take that all up under endospores later in unit one. But as we're going to see at that time, the cytoplasmic membrane plays critical roles in endospore formation. So there are a number of functions associated with the cytoplasmic membrane and bacteria that we wouldn't see in eukaryotic cells, including the electron transport chain for aerobic and anaerobic respiration, and the site for uh, photosynthesis for bacteria that carry out photosynthesis, 
That's where the rotary motor for the flagellum is located. It's involved in waste removal and plays a role in endospore production. Now it brings us to bacterial division because the cytoplasmic membrane plays key roles in that whole process. So a bacteria divide by binary fission, which means that one bacterium splits into two. Binary means two, fission means split. And because the, each bacterium splits in two, the bacteria are going to double their number every generation time. So the generation time is the time it takes for a population of bacteria to double in number. And because they're doubling in number every generation time, we call that geometric progression, the doubling of a population every generation time, which is a direct result of binary fission, each cell splitting into two. So early during DNA replication, each strand of DNA makes a complementary copy of itself. But as it's doing so, the DNA attaches to proteins where it's going to become the cell division plane. And some of the major proteins involved in chromosome separation bacteria are called PAR proteins. <coughs> Excuse me. So they take the place of the mitotic apparatus we would see in eukaryotic cells. As each chromosomal strand makes a complementary copy of itself, it binds to these PAR proteins and they help to push and pull the chromosomes apart so that by the time of cell division, there is a single chromosome in each half of the cell. Remember, bacteria only have one chromosome, they're haploid or one end. And then at the center of the bacteria are a group of proteins that we mentioned earlier called FTS proteins, and these form a ring at the division plane. And they help form the cell division apparatus called the divisome. And so it's the divisome that plays many key roles in uh, division of bacteria. There's a whole bunch of proteins su such as these listed here, which you don't have to know. But these are collectively called FTS proteins. And they form the cell division organelle or divisome located at the center of the cell. And that's what's going to allow the chromosomes to separate the peptidoglycan and septum or cross wall to form, the ingrowth and constriction of the cytoplasmic membrane for cell division, the production of energy by breaking down ATP, all of that's going to be provided by these various FTS proteins in the divisome. And we have several nice little animations here of bacteria dividing by time-lapse photography, dividing by binary fission. So if we look at this first one here, You see that we start with four bacteria, but each bacterium splits in two, so they're doubling every generation time. So you start with one bacterium, and in a fairly short period of time, have huge numbers of bacteria. Uh, here's another shot of the same thing, time lapse, except it uh, is a little slower, so you can follow it better. There's some still electron micrographs shown at the beginning that show the bacteria dividing. Um, we're going to kind of skip past some of that and get down to where we can actually see the time-lapse photography. So now it's slow enough where you can see each bacterium is splitting in two. Each one of those splits in two. Each one of those splits in two. And so you see they're doubling their number every generation time. Generation time being the time it takes to double. And because they're increasing geometrically, doubling every generation time, you can get an astronomical number of bacteria produced in a short period of time. And that's why if only one little bacterium would fall on your Petri plate and replicate its little heart out, the next day you would see a colony visible to the naked eye containing uh, literally hundreds of billions of bacteria. And here's one more time lapse of binary fission. Uh, where there's fluorescence imaging, where you can see the bacteria fluorescing and you can see the divisome forming and the division process a little more clearly. So here we see the bacteria and we see they're getting ready to divide in the center here. So a little white ring you're seeing forming there is the divisome and that's providing energy. It is 
uh, making the peptidoglycan cross wall or septum, and it's constricting the membrane so that once the cell divides, they can pinch in two and form two bacteria from one. And a couple electron micrographs showing dividing bacteria. So there's a little self check you can do on binary fission. Now, finally, uh, one of the structures we can alter in order to try to control microbial growth is the cytoplasmic membrane. It's not an ideal structure because the bacterial cytoplasmic membrane is not that different from our cytoplasmic membrane. Most things that alter bacterial membrane permeability also alter our cell membrane permeability. So what's typically done here is that their chemicals being used are in a concentration that's harmful enough to the microorganism to cause leakage, but not so harmful that it affects enough of our cells to cause harm. But there's a few antibiotics like polymyxins. That's one of the three antibiotics found in triple antibiotic creams that you can buy over the counter. And uh, that happened that happens to damage membrane permeability and gram negatives, especially the outer membrane that we'll learn about later. Tyrosidins are another group of antibiotics that affect membrane permeability. Quite a few of our disinfectants and antiseptics work this way. Uh, disinfectants are chemicals we use to control all organisms on inanimate objects or surfaces, but generally they're too toxic to use on tissue, whereas antiseptics can inhibit microbial growth, but it's usually not toxic enough that it can harm our tissue. So a lot of disinfectants and antiseptics like orthophenophenol, chlorhexidine, hexachlorophene, zephyrin, alcohol, triclosans, uh, these are often used in disinfection and decontamination. And at the concentration they're used, they can alter the microbial cytoplasmic membrane, uh, but they're not concentrated enough to harm enough membranes in our cells to be harmful to the human body. As long as, of course, they're used appropriately, most of these are used topically, obviously, and you couldn't take them internally because they would cause very serious harm. So remember, when you alter the membrane, it causes leakage of cellular needs. It's not causing lysis of the bacterium because they have a cell wall. The cell wall doesn't lyse, but if the membrane's altered, then the membrane can no longer hold in the various nutrients needed for metabolism and they leak out and that inhibits or kills microorganisms. So when we get to control of microorganisms later on in unit two, we'll see more about how some of our antibiotics can alter the cytoplasmic membrane of bacteria causing leakage. And at the very end of this long soft chalk lesson, we have our self quiz over the whole unit. So again, you should go through and do the self quiz covering all the methods of transport that we talked about in this unit. And that wraps up our soft chalk lesson on the cytoplasmic membrane and cellular transport in bacteria.